No, it's, it's a pleasure to talk about uh, some of our work. I will not go too much in robotics in my talk, but I will talk about, in principle, about the interaction of AI, neuroscience, and a bit also of robotics. Um, in detail, I want to do the following. I will uh, try to discuss with you and, and explain to you a few concepts and ideas, and then hopefully also stimulate you to think about some points. And if you have a question now or at the end, um, just ask, because uh, it should be also um, uh, yeah, coming from your side, um, uh, 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 because a lot of what I'm saying, no one knows the answer to, so you are invited to solve this in the next years. So the first point is I want to, to discuss a bit with you how to biologically constrain neural network models. Because as you all know, the Human Brain Project wants to build simulations of the brain, and there should be not just technical solutions, but there should be really um, um, yeah, inspired and somehow constrained by the knowledge from the brain. And how to do that is actually very challenging, and no one has a complete answer to that. And I will discuss with you several ways how we can do that. After that, I will um, talk about one way to do that using um, uh, convolutional deep learning networks as modules for building larger models. And I will describe a bit what they can do. Um, maybe you know something about, but to get on the same stage, I will say a few words about them. And then I will talk about um, a specific application of this kind of approach, this uh, top-down functional teleological approach, um, uh, where we applied this to saliency processing. And um, I will show you that despite that these networks are not constrained directly by the brain, but only by the task it solves, it mimics very precisely how humans solve saliency tasks, better than any classical model which has been built. So in that sense, it gives us the insight uh, that it might be good not only to do, do bottom-up models, like from measurements and tiny cells and so on, but also have the global picture in mind, what, what are the problems that the human brain solves, and how can we then, from there, build learning machines which kind of derive representations which might be then also found uh, in the human brain. Uh, I say a lot of human because my talk also tries to um, focus on, on how can we uh, build models of human performance, human cognition, because um, that makes it even more challenging to link it to the brain because we have limited access to the brain. In the healthy subject, we can use EEG, fMRI, and so on, and we have limited um, possibilities to use intracranial electrical recordings, and I will not use this today in my talk. So, so we, are, we are kind of um, uh, 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 have a bigger challenge than if you do invasive animal research. But then you are limited to talk about like cognition and so on, because this is, of course, as you all know, limited in animals. So therefore, while I'm not solving today with the saliency uh, uh, problem, which is purely human, there's, of course, variants of that also in animals, it's still the approach I want to uh, describe today is an approach which is uh, maybe a good approach, or at least one which you can consider for understanding better human performance. And at the end, if time allows, I will talk about some more recent developments we and others in the context of the HVP are doing, especially the first point, we, we want to build modular cognitive architectures now, um, which, which are very much built on what I teach you today, or tell you today, but uh, in a much more larger scale. And uh, if I have time, I will talk a bit about this, it's a bit optional, and I will also, if time allows, a bit uh, discuss with you how we can go from what many people call uh, narrow AI to more kind of general AI. Um, uh, uh, and, and I will discuss some, some important points where also brain science can maybe help to, to show where to go. So, so the first point is just to give you an overview of the general kind of philosophy or the general aims we have in, in the project I'm having in the Human Brain Project. It's called a co-design project. Co-design means that there are many different SPs, many different parts of the HPP collaborate on this project. And that's uh, something I like a lot on the HVP, that this is one of the unique things, that suddenly a lab like mine, which has no access alone to, to say, robotics, suddenly can indeed uh, um, uh, work with people and, and help to build maybe better robotical systems, um, although we have uh, uh, not done this uh, before we entered the HVP. So that's also showing you that also labs which interface with other uh, labs and po technical possibilities of the HVP can do research and can bring their research also in a perspective which they, they can otherwise maybe not do. So the idea here is to, to kind of uh, use some constraints, and I will discuss the pros and cons of different constraints, more large-scale constraints, more fine-grained constraints, to build uh, 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 an architecture which is in this case limited to some visual motor functions, 
but in a way that the modules there, the areas there, which are now about 30, which we model, um, are kind of relatable to uh, real brain data, uh, anatomical data, atlas data, functional data, and so on. This is very limited, I will discuss this in a moment, but nonetheless, at least there are constraints that you take some findings kind of serious to, to, to constrain models. Um, then the models, of course, um, are implemented in neural nets, and there is again, you have many degrees of freedom, as I already alluded to. You can do it bottom up, you can try to stick close to your measurements, close to your data, but then you don't reach the level of understanding you know, how we, how we reason about something, how we solve a problem, but you are limited uh, to the very um, uh, restricted measurement points you have uh, from your data and, uh, and, and go not much further. So therefore, facing these limitations of bottom-up models, we will uh, we use in our project here a lot top-down modeling. Um, uh, and then we, we also link the models to robotics. So I will show you a little bit about that also, because um, and by linking that to robotics, we not only kind of demonstrate that, that um, the ideas we put in these models are are kind of valid because they, they act in a real physical world or simulated world. Yeah, we also use simulated robotics. But the most important point for me is the closed loop we establish so that action and perception become closed. So that you change the world and this changes your, your, your visual or, or auditory or whatever uh, uh, perceptual system. And then you can kind of have closed loop systems which is actually um, what, what we, we are interested in to study. So not only kind of seeing this coming into something and is processed for something, but that you really, with the possibility of robotics, uh, allow to investigate uh, closed loop uh, uh, systems, with including the action side. And that gives you new views on how you model perception, because perception and action are not independent, but perception is largely for action, that you do the right actions, and therefore this uh, is then seen much more as an integral approach. Uh, uh, after some general points, I will focus but only on one module today because of time. That's the same as the module which I mentioned earlier. And I will go a bit more in detail there so that you see how this in principle goes. But similar approaches we also used for other aspects of that model, which gets visual input, which processes them in a kind of, as much as we know, realistic way, uh, with, with uh, retinal density cells and so on, so that it's not like in a uh, artificial intelligence model, it's much more biologically correct, but then it, it, is, it is fed in deep learning networks, which we train, and I will show you how, and that part I will describe uh, uh, in most detail today. Okay, um, an important point is, of course, um, as I said, what do we use from the brain to um, constrain models? And one uh, important point is that, you know, and, and that's um, also where the HVP is very um, advanced, namely to bring people together which work on, on multiple scales, in vivo, um, uh, uh, in vitro, um, using post-mortem slices, for example, uh, tissues from animals, and so on. So, so you get kind of uh, insights in, in, in multiple levels of brain organization. But, of course, it is not trivial, and that's, that is a discussion we have in the HVP since the first year, uh, at least when I started to join the HVP, I think after the first year, um, namely how can we link the different levels fruitfully to, uh, to each other so that we understand function at a higher level by um, understanding more mechanistic uh, um, uh, interactions of elements at lower levels, right? So how can we really understand more emerging properties at a higher level from the things at the lower level? And, you, and, and some people think that is very easy, but it turns out it is not. Because uh, if you, for example, study something in one animal and in one area with one method, it is not trivial to extrapolate that how this is underlying, for example, what you study with completely different methods, say, in the human. So therefore, th this linkage is non-trivial. It's very challenging. And, and, and one of the best approaches is to try, at least, to have um, uh, multi-species measurements, non-invasive and invasive ones, and use more or less the same paradigm as much as you can. But of course, at some point, this doesn't work anymore. Paradigms become too complex, too com cognitive, too human-like. This will not work. And therefore, I call this here the optimistic hypothesis. If I talk in front of the HPP officials, I, I, I remove this optimistic, right, and just have here hypothesis. You know? But the idea is really that, that, that people think that with neuroscience and computer simulations, 
uh, you can um, uh, reach at some point a causal understanding how more complex phenomena at a higher level of organization of the brain can be related and explained by mechanisms at lower levels of the brain. This sounds cool and nice, but it's in practice very, very challenging. And that you should understand because um, 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 yeah, if that would be easy, we wouldn't need such a big project like the Human Brain Project, and that will also be a problem um, many years or centuries uh, after the Human Brain Project. This will not be solved easily. But, of course, we make progress. This, this is, of course, the, the, the optimistic part. Um, um, uh, you, 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 should, you, you, you learn by doing. So if you then jump in the water and try it, uh, then you also realize what is possible and what is not possible. And uh, we did this for our uh, uh, approach here, the visual motor model. And we, for example, used for, for, for specifying the architecture and saying how many network modules and how, how should they connect it in a model, we constrained that very much by looking in the literature, by doing some own experiments um, uh, to constrain that and looking in, in the human brain atlas. They have seductoric areas. Uh, that does this fit? And, and, but the important point is um, you would have an, an, an empty uh, architecture because the most important thing is not that you have the right areas but that you know what they do, the function, right? So therefore the um, uh, uh, most important part is that you um, put some processing into these areas, right? And then it becomes more and more challenging because about many areas in the visual motor pathway, so from the visual system via the visu visual temporal system, the parietal system, the prefrontal cortex, the motor system, in visual motor processing if you have not just reflexes or reactions, but also some processing, you have basically the whole co cognitive apparatus uh, uh, included, right? And of course, we do not know for many of these areas what they really do. Or we know from some homologs in other species what they maybe do. And then it becomes already a guessing. You say, okay, if in the monkey we find these kind of cell behaviors, if they do a similar task as a human is doing, then we can assume that we also should have neurons or units in a model which, which have receptive fields or calculations which mimic that and calculate similar things, right? So you, you are a little bit, um, uh, you have to be uh, innovative. You have to kind of um, um, invent and, and ma make loose couplings between data and models. If you stick very close to your data, it can be very nice to understand your data, which is of course very important. This may be the prime thing you should do. But if you then want to extrapolate that and build more, more global functionality, you will not s uh, come to that point by just sticking to the exactly to your data, to your 10 neurons you recorded, or, 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 or the, 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 the fMRI data, which is very coarse, or EEG measurements. So you, you have to be inventive. Otherwise, you cannot really um, uh, jump forward. And that's actually the question I want to raise. How do we best constrain biological representations um, uh, using measurements in the human. And of course, this goes back to the question, what is the best level or appropriate level to um, understand um, uh, cognition and action? And um, um, one of my heroes when I studied was Marvin Minsky. And he, uh, 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 in one of his books said, uh, I think it was the Society of Mind, he said, to explain the mind, we have to show how minds are built from mindless stuff, um, from parts that are much smaller and simpler than anything we would in itself consider smart. So what he wants to say here is, um, is a bit of critique on some older psychological concepts where you explained a psychological phenomena by referring to other psychological phenomena. And you basically had not what I tried to explain before, these lower level uh, layers or organization principles of the brain uh, where you look there at interactions to explain the next higher layer, right? Organization principle. And therefore, um, uh, uh, that quote leads to looking into more mechanistic interactions of smaller entities. Of course, many neuroscientists see here he means, or he could at least interpret that, by looking in the neurons and their connectivity, which of course is in some sense correct. But of course, it's very detailed for understanding large-scale cognitive and action phenomena, right? And um, um, uh, in, in, in the neuroimaging domain, uh, you have heard last talk, um, we can also be a little bit more coarse here because the, the, the cortex is organized, as you all know, also in layers and in cortical columns. And it might be that, that the level of uh, which we can see with, with modern human brain imaging might be helpful to also understand better uh, um, uh, some, some phenomena by uh, um, understanding the underlying organizational principles 
at the level of cortical layers and cortical columns. So that is one constraint which has emerged in the last years, which can be used to, to, to look at smarter stuff. And it must not be automatically the neurons, right? Because as I said before, in the human brain at least, we have limited access to, to neuronal data. Um, yeah, I just said that. I just want to, to say that um, it is, a, of course, um, a little bit sad in the sense that we know a, a lot about how we can build models. So, so not only since we have convolutional deep networks and so on, but already many years earlier, um, um, uh, people have developed neural-like models or neural models. Connectionism was a, was a nice um, uh, movement. Parallel distributed processing and so on, where people already developed more toy models, but still neural net models, which had and, and, and described a lot of features which are very, very similar to what you find in kind of more um, human-like performance. Like, like you can reproduce errors, you can reproduce graceful degradation that you are not uh, too brittle uh, uh, as, as a performing uh, human uh, subject and, and that as compared to purely symbolic AI systems, these connectionist and PDP uh, distributed network models um, uh, showed a lot of the same principles that were also observed mainly in animal uh, brains. For example, if you also removed some neurons from your model, the system didn't break down. It's not like if you change one line in code of a sequential program, usually the program just doesn't work anymore. You get errors, uh, uh, but in the brain and in these models, you find kind of similar properties. So therefore, um, um, the point was, I formulate it now a bit differently. If we could find ways to, to know what representations are in the different areas of the brain, which could be layers in a complex network, and how they are connected, you know, then of course you would be able to build computer models which are quite precisely mimicking the human brain, not just at the level of large-scale architectural organizations, but at the level of, of calculation, what they compute, what representations they have, how they are transformed from area to area and so forth. And that is actually what excited me a lot in high field imaging because this was, was at least um, one approach in the human brain, and that's what I want to stress, um, uh, to find out what representations are used in hidden areas in the human brain. Right, so I want to, to talk very briefly uh, about um, that in a moment, but, but this whole approach which I try to describe now, we could also call data-driven or bottom-up modeling, where we really kind of try to understand the, the data we measure, we record as good as possible, and the models kind of are close to the data, they're not extrapolating too much, uh, and that is very helpful to understand neuronal mechanisms. I'm sure Lars has talked about apical amplification, uh, yeah, a little bit maybe. These are mechanisms which are of course very, very interesting because they might reveal how the cortex in principle does certain calculations like predictions, errors, and, and updates, and so on. The point is um, 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 that's, that's, that's good because you can use these principles everywhere than in your model if you think they are uh, globally valid. But um, 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 you might not understand by doing this data-driven models um, how certain specific functions are performed in the brain. Then you need to really know what are the representation, the content representations uh, 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 internally. For example, if we, if we see uh, the face area lighting up, if I show you faces or I ask you to imagine faces, then we, we see there is an area which seems to be specialized for that, but we still don't know today what exactly are the representations used. So what are the, the neurons in this area really coding, right? No one knows yet. And that's what I want to know. I want to know and measure, if possible, the representations, the feature, is it the distance of the eyes, the color of the hair, and many other features which are coded there. There's a little bit of knowledge from animal research, but it's very, very scarce. And, and therefore, that would be nice to understand that. And of course, in the animal, and there the are uh, researchers who do that, you can, of course, put in the homologue areas in the monkey, for example, electrodes, and try to find out. But again, uh, that's also limited because you have not millions of, of electrodes there to really understand local and global at the same time. And of course, you are also limited because at some point, how we perceive the world is not the same, even how macaque monkeys perceive the world. At some point, we want to really understand the uniquely human cognition and, and action. And therefore, uh, that is, is limited. Nonetheless, um, I want to show you one example only um, how we do that 
and try to do that. Uh, um, uh, this is a very simple example, but it shows you maybe uh, what I mean by that and why we make progress there in, in human imaging. The idea is actually um, 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 to, to go back to very old fMRI studies where we try to understand, actually Lars was one of the uh, uh, co uh, 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 experimenters here, um, uh, co-authors here of this paper, and we, what we wanted to understand was motion processing in the brain, which is a topic Lars and I did many years and still do, uh, but the, uh, the point was there at that time our scanner, it's actually wrong, there's old 3T, this is 1.5T, it's actually wrong, you know, it was a 1.5 Tesla scanner where Lars and I worked uh, on, on motion processing, uh, and we had a series of papers um, uh, uh, together, but this was the first, as far as I remember at least, and in that work uh, we just were happy to see um, which part of the brain responds to motion and to motion imagery, that was actually the new part, and to illusions of motion, but I will not go into this uh, uh, in a minute, yes, but not now. So the point was, what, uh, why I'm showing that is, that at that time, that uh, people did not expect that in the human brain you could ever find out features of motion. So you could find an area called MT or V5, this one here, which responds when things moved and they did not respond very much when things didn't move in your visual world, right? So now you are so, so nicely static, my MT is basically silent now. So if, if, if some people move, then of course it would res respond there's something there moving to there, right? So therefore that's, that's what we wanted to, to see. But at that time we basically were happy already that we find an area which responds to any kind of motion versus no motion. But it was not subcategorical, it was not feature-based, it was not at the level, what is code in that area? How is motion represented there? And that, uh, um, when we then moved to high field imaging, we could ask questions like that. And then we ask, um, um, can we see what is represented in this area? What features, what, what coding principles? And we found out, I mean, this was, of course, uh, um, done already before in monkeys with rec electrode recordings. But in the human, it was the first time that we got maps of the human MT, which showed here in color code, that different voxels, different columns in this area code for different directions of motion, right? Which was expected from animal research, but was never shown in the human before. So therefore, that is important because it tells us how we can uh, uh, understand uh, these uh, Minsky smaller structures um, to understand how we perceive, for example, direction of motion, right? And to push this a bit further, we also got kind of tuning curves from the voxels for different uh, directions of motion, actually so-called axis of motion, and they look very nicely similar in, 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 in its unimodality, also in its width, as is expected from population responses from animal recordings. So therefore, that was quite satisfying to see that it all made a lot of sense. And it kind of fueled um, uh, more, more work on investigating feature codes, uh, uh, representations of units, these are here now columnar units in the human brain, to use as constraints for modeling. Right? You can now make a data-driven model to kind of uh, have this topographic, simulate this topographic layout, how these um, uh, responses come into being from, from V1 and so on, right? Um, I want to show you one more example because we can even go further and relate this to conscious percepts. And for example, here is um, uh, an experiment, uh, again, which also Lars has done in, 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 in a similar study, but we did it here at the columnar level and that means we used uh, not only uh, physical, horizontal, and vertical motion, like you see here, but we used an ambiguous stimulus. So in that stimulus, you see either um, these two squares going like vertical, or you see them going horizontal, right? If you look long enough, you should see for some time the one and sometime the other one. Depends a lot on the distance to the screen and so on, so I'm not saying it works for everyone. But I can tell you, you can make that stimulus so, uh, uh, if you do the experiments, that it stays for one motion for five to 10 seconds and then switches to the other interpretation. The cool point here is the stimulus doesn't change. So the, the, the conscious percept you have is just in your brain and only there. Your brain decides what to see and what becomes conscious in your, in your mind, right? So and why I'm showing you that is that with this uh, high field MRI, we can now relate these conscious percepts to neuronal columnar measurements of features, which you can also use for, for, for constraining networks in the human brain. And it's a human uh, 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 result. It's the first time when, when these kind of uh, uh, conscious percepts 
of difference, of content difference, horizontal versus vertical, can be explained by neighboring, or, or kind of um, multiple, but neighboring differential uh, features we, map, we mapped before for horizontal and vertical motion, how they can be kind of uh, revealed. And um, um, here's a little movie which shows you that a bit more clearly. We zoom in now in the brain to MT, and I show you the voxels, which were classified before as horizontal and vertical motion in that subject, and you see that on, uh, on the left side uh, is the interpretation of the constant stimulus, and if the subject has horizontal, the reds go up, the red voxels, and if the subject perceives it as vertical, the green goes up. This, of course, smooth and averaged over many trials, but it is real data, so it's really showing a differential effect we really measured uh, in the brain. So that shows that you can now relate uh, not only laminar differences, which is very important to understand the mechanisms of interactions between areas, but you can, and that's also important for constraining models, you can also reveal and extract from the brain uh, representations which are more meaningful, more content specific than just saying this brain area responds to motion, this responds to phases. But for models, you need more. You want to understand the computations and representations, and then you need to start to say, I know now what should be in this model, because these are the features, here the directions of motion, which we have measured in the human brain. This is really important. Okay, um, but I want to stress the limits of that, because to get such an experiment done is several years of work. So it's, it's actually impossible to predict that we will find uh, even more fine-grained features, like for whole processing streams. Like if we do object recognition from, from, from you know, uh, oriented uh, uh, bars in V1, where you have a topography over the whole visual space, up to mid-level to higher-level features, that we, we measure them all and uh, unravel them in this high-field fMI. Um, I don't know whether we achieve that in the near future. So, so therefore, we cannot hope that with this technique, we will constrain the models in a very a precise way in a short term of time. This is basically impossible with this technique. It's too slow, it takes too much time, we have resolution limits, and so on and so on and so on. So it is, it, it, it is helping, but it is of course not a general solution. Um, uh, and also the connectivity. We, we, at the maximum we see here are the representations in gray matter, in areas. We do not see the connections by functional MI. Of course there are techniques like diffusion-weighted MI where you can see connectivity between area, the physical substrate, right? But it is not at the resolution to see this from feature to feature, just from area to area, even that is sometimes difficult, right? So we have still not the possibility in the human brain, uh, at least not in vivo, to unravel uh, uh, the information we would need to make more, more specific constraints from the human brain. So while my career is much inspired by this uh, uh, high field imaging, I do not see this as you know, um, helping us to constrain performant models uh, uh, of, of cognition and action in the human. And therefore, I want to show you now an alternative, which I found also very attractive, and I hope that we in the future relate the two approaches. That's actually my hope, and that's what I try to do in the next three years of the HVP, to guide a team to bring this bottom-up and top-down approach together. That's my, my, my goal for the next years. But now I want to show you um, this other approach, it is very much inspired by deep learning because you, 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 you start from the back of backside of the problem. You say, you know what, if I have learned to perceive all these faces and objects here, if I would train a network to do that, a deep learning network, maybe it solves it and if I train it to solve it by the outputs in the same way like humans, so I give it the same task and the same human performance as training, does then the model discovers for me the right features, the connections, and the representations in the hidden layers, which might be the same as we would find in the brain. Then, then a deep learning network is no longer just a technical help for analyzing my data, but it becomes a serious model of how the brain might work, and as a tool to find the features. No longer like imaging, but I use then training of these networks to find the features. Of course, this is highly speculative. The features we might find by these tools might be completely different, right? So we have to do some validation to be sure that indeed something what these networks find when they get trained on tasks has to do something with the brain, right? Otherwise, this is of course just um, uh, wishful thinking. But precisely that has happened. Many people have done this. They have trained uh, networks for 
um, uh, for example, object recognition and found that in the different deep layers of these networks, the representations were quite similar, not perfect, but quite similar if you use some global comparisons um, uh, to what you find in these kind of corresponding stages in the human processing stream. So therefore, there is some evidence that indeed, uh, if you force these networks to solve the same tasks as humans do, that they organize also uh, into representations and potentially also connections, which are similar. Yeah? Ah, that's not f uh, it the best. Is th we know the most of the visual system. There we can make more precise comparisons. But the same approach is now happening in the auditory system. I see this just emerging, the papers coming out. And i show you in a moment, we do this with attention and saliency, which is a much more higher cognitive phenomenon, which, which, which builds on vision but goes way beyond. So, so I come to that and try exactly answer your question to go further than that, right? But, but you are right, uh, uh, vision is the most uh, uh, used uh, example of that. Yes, absolutely. But we should also be clear that if we are maximally positive, um, we see there a fruitful interaction in both directions. So, so, so even the current convolutional deep networks are not made by purely technical reasoning, but they were inspired by the architecture of the brain. Right? They have not fully connected layers, but they have something like receptive fields. We will see this in a moment. And therefore, and the architecture hierarchical nature of these networks is also inspired, again, by the visual system. But we know now, also partially from work in our lab and many others, that also the auditory system has similar hierarchies like the visual system. So in that sense, we basically see here um, um, uh, um, that this teleological approach coming from the end goal uh, of what a system should solve, what problems should solve, and using this fascinating learning which these deep learning networks have, to try to find in the, from the input, we give just the input and the desired output and hope that a kind of pre-structured network then finds the right connections and representations in the different layers which you know, solve the task but maybe solve it in a similar way as the brain uh, uh, solves this task. Actually, um, this was pioneered or put at least um, 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 the ideas around since, since long but it, it was clearly articulated by uh, Yamens and Di Carlo, who wrote a very nice paper and showed, not actually in that paper already, you see already different sensory systems, still sensory, but not just vision. They, they, they have this, they claim this kind of goal-driven networks approach, really for multiple sensory systems and show evidence for that. They show a lot of um, um, uh, papers and summarize their work and show evidence that in their opinion, indeed, if you constrain by, by the task, uh, n these networks, uh, uh, then you can maybe find really that they develop um, the right representations and when you look then in the brain, you can then use this as hypotheses and check this in the brain whether you find them back. Okay, um, so y you know of course this comparison is not, not easy, right? So you, you can, um, 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 uh, like this is this p a picture from the Di Carlo paper and you see then you can on the one hand have the visual system and the other hand you can have a deep neural network and you can kind of try to relate the representations, maybe also the connections, which is more challenging in the human brain or monkey brain, which is shown here. Uh, but you can, of course, look how similar at the different stages of the network on the one hand and the uh, uh, brain on the other hand, uh, how similar are these representations. And if you do that, and there are various techniques to do that we have not the time to go into, uh, then you indeed find that, like, like I have maybe later a picture where I show you this a little bit and you see it's pretty astonishingly similar. But just to, to uh, understand better the, 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 the detailed network I present to you, I want to um, just um, refresh for those who, uh, um, some might know this already, but just for, for some uh, who are maybe not so familiar with this deep learning. Uh, the important point is, and again, as I said, that you can read this from Lacoon, from, from Jeff Hinton, from all the, the big figures in that field, that indeed the convolutional networks are inspired by what they learned about the brain architecture, the visual system, right? So this is not coming from nothing. But this is a network which is not a convolutional. This is a classical, fully connected network, right? Where you have uh, units uh, at, the, at the input side and at the output side. Here you put, for example, in, in vision, you would put in here a picture, for example, or a movie. And here at the output side, you would have labels what at the moment the system should recognize in this picture, like a dog, for example, right? Uh, or a moving car, if it's a movie, go going, going from left to right or whatever, right? And then these 
representations emerge be, by adjusting the weights from the input, so from all these kind of input nodes, you get weights to each node, separate weights, and the synapses here, or the connection strengths in the model, they get adjusted to, to help to, to get a, a recode more and more from the visual features, if it's a visual network, to more semantic features, right? Higher levels features, combining lower features to more complex features. And this can even go to things like semantics, that, that you know what is animate or inanimate and things like that. And then you have at the output these kind of more abstract categories like objects or um, um, uh, categories like animate, inanimate, man-made, and so on, right? And then these networks are trained and um, uh, basically, um, uh, since this is not a, um, a, a hierarchical network, not brain-like, not like the visual system, um, um, this was used in certain com competitions where you get huge data sets and you can present a new network type and then compare to, to the best current sta state-of-the-art recognition performance of new pictures, which you don't know. They test then your network with new data and then they give you a score, how good your network performs. Uh, on Kaggle, for example, you have these huge databases and, and tests where you can submit your data. Uh, and then if you use these networks for vision, they will be not very good. You know? so, that, so therefore, whatever you do, um, uh, they're not very good. Right? So, so the, uh, the insight came when, when, when people discovered we should use more networks which are more like visual networks. Right? And if they submitted those, suddenly they reached not only the highest performance in all the tests done before with any model, not even only neural. You can have SVM, you can have some symbolic stuff that beat, beat everything available uh, before and their performance was for the first time at a human performance level. So the, the, the generalization performance, if I show you any pictures of Facebook and ask you what you see there, that performance you have as a human was the first time matched by these convolutional networks, right? So that gave that excitement because they became suddenly at a level of performance which is comparable, sometimes even better, than what humans do. This is important to, to realize. And it, it is, of course, based on massive amounts of training. You just not train them with one or two pictures, but you have millions usually, and know the answer, and give the network the answers. But after seeing millions of pictures and knowing what to do, and learning what to do, you can show them completely new pictures, and they will be almost perfect and you are also not always perfect, by the way. And the same level they will achieve, right? You see this it's here, for example, if you use these kind of hierarchical convolution networks, we have then like smaller receptive fields, which are called here filters or uh, kernels, you know, which, which, which convolve. That means that they go at each position in the, in, in the, in the image, and, and, and you have different, different filters which look for different features. And that's what we assume also happens in the brain. Like V1 has for each piece of the visual field, a whole bank of filters which look for oriented bars, right? And then uh, the, the, the kind of columns for horizontal will only respond if in the stimulus at the right position in space, there is a horizontal bar. But it looks only for a tiny piece of, of the image. Same they do in convolutional networks, right? So it's very much inspired by that. And, and, and then these features you have then will be then combined to form features at the next, next level. You have then another new set of features. And now comes the important point. The, the features at the next layer and the next layer and the next layer, you have not to manually know and, 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 and put in the model. What I try to do with this high field imaging, right? I try to go somewhere deep, find the features, and I know and can put them in my model. That is the idea of the bottom-up driven modeling. But here, just the input and the output is enough that the right representations at the different layers emerge by training. Because they have to have some features and some abstractions which helps the system to recognize the same images like we have to recognize. So they, they are constrained to find good representations which help to solve exactly the same task the human has to solve. And this is the analogy and this is the idea of these teleological models. There are just a few examples. One is um, a so-called MNIST data set, which is a, a data set of numbers. And um, uh, this just shows how this works. So here is, for example, we could call this in the brain like V1. We have different uh, filters for, for, for small features like horizontal bars. And these filters, uh, 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 the same filter, uh, uh, is kind of moved over, the, over space. And then you get a feature map here. And it finds where in space I found, for example, if I'm here, 
this map is maybe for vertical, then it would respond maybe a bit here, maybe here, but it would not respond here, but it would respond here. And then, then the, the other one for horizontal would respond here, would respond here, and so on, right? And this would be in a different map, different features. And, um, um, and, and then you put these features again, you pool them. Pooling means you abstract a little bit from the exact position to shrink the amount of, 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 of cells, of units in the next layer. Uh, you get a little bit of spatial uncertainty, which is a problem, I will not go into detail. But then you have kind of a combination of all, you can find by learning another combination for features here, combining all the features at the corresponding space in the lower level again and again and again, right? Until you reach a, a level where you put what is called a softmax layer, where you put a layer on top, which is basically full of categories of what you want kind of the system to output, like dog, like cat, like, like, like human face. You can also train it on, on the names of people and let it uh, discriminate uh, people, whatever you want. It depends on what you train the system. Okay, that's how these uh, networks work. Um, we'll skip a few of the details, but um, um, yeah, that's, that's how they work. And, and, and now I want to just mention um, what also the question was before. These networks have become, since 12, uh, 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 kind of um, the dominating um, uh, model for um, 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 uh, um, technical solutions of object recognition because they, they be, 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 uh, reached in 12 human level performance. And of course they were further and further developed. But they were also applied to other things like auditory processing, natural language processing and so on. So this kind of convolutional idea has been used also in other modalities. And it's interesting because if technology gets something in their hands which is successful in one domain, they of course apply it to other domains and now we can actually use these approaches and look back in the brain whether in these other domains we also find hierarchical models which what receptor field size and so on. So, so the, the, the positive thing is an interaction between brain inspires AI to build better models and then we use the better models as helping us to understand our brain data. Right? I think that is the best view of this interaction of AI and neuroscience. This is actually, um, if it works, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, a promising approach to go. Just to tell you what I mean by human level performance, if you look at the, the MNIST data set, um, you find that um, um, uh, um, uh, this recognizes handwritten digits as good as you would. I know when I was a student, I did neural nets uh, in my PhD, and uh, I could never reach that at that time. One reason was that the training was difficult from, from uh, the computers were very slow, of course, but also um, um, the training data sets were limited. Instead of here like thousands of, uh, 60,000 of handwritten digits, I had maybe 100 because I couldn't train a network with, with 60,000. I had not, also not the data, by the way. So therefore, a, a lot has changed uh, over time, but the network principles, how we train them to adjust the weights is basically the same as, as 30, 40 years ago. But uh, at that time, a big breakthrough was made, namely that you can train uh, uh, also the hidden layers, right? This is so-called backpropagation algorithm. So you have an input and an output, and that, that there were algorithms since, since, since almost um, uh, uh, 60, 70 years available, how to train the synapses between two layers. But if you have hidden layers and only here tell what to do, no one knew, uh, until the 80s, um, uh, how to train any kind of position in a deep network, right? And, and, and this is another thing which made it uh, in principle possible to learn any um, uh, uh, computable function with neural networks, right? That you could train deep networks. But more importantly is that um, um, uh, um, the way how they learn, learn was if you constrain the network architecture uh, shown by these networks um, to become also similar to, 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 to um, what humans do and especially what the performance of humans. For example, here you see um, from the few errors this network is doing, i show you the errors now, it's only th from 10,000 test digits, some other people draw the letters, right? Three, four with the hand, right? And then you rec let, let this network recognize those and it makes from 10,000 uh, only 33 wrong. And the wrong ones are those here. These are the wrong ones. So, and, and I think um, I would also not know what to do, right? What is this guy here? Is it a two <laughs> or a seven, right? So that's what I want to say when I say human level performance, the errors the networks are doing mimics the same errors humans are doing. 
right? This is the interesting thing. So therefore, these networks seem to be constrained to learn and develop internal representations and similarities and how to analyze the features. Is it more, more, more round? Is it more shifted? And you know, it seems to develop the same internal mechanisms that a human uses to, to judge and categorize these kind of um, uh, inputs. There are much more complex layers, and I just want to scare you a little bit. Um, uh, it began with like 10, 50 layers, but now many of these networks, famous networks from Google and from Oxford and so on, uh, have uh, Microsoft has several hundred layers now in their networks. So that, that, that kind of explodes at the moment because, you know, it is also a rich and the poor thing. Uh, if you have the computers, you know, you can scale that up. And, and concerning just one remark to CO2 and energy consumption, training these networks is like flying from here to US, right? This is, uh, it costs a lot of energy. And therefore, you also have, of course, um, uh, um, um, you yeah, have to know that this is not trivial because you need millions and the more the better of data sets uh, 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 to, to train these networks. And you know, the, the, the networks get deeper and deeper, but also more performance, uh, still a little bit better than the previous generation and so on. And one important point, which is a little bit also um, 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 uh, important by relating this to the brain, um, at, at each layer, you start, for example, here, if you have a colorful picture with a tensor, a tensor, a three-dimensional tensor, you have kind of a 2D image, and you have three color channels, RGB, right? Which gives you the input uh, volume into such a training network, right? If it's colorful images. If it's just grayscale, you have just one, with, with each unit says, tells you at the input, how, how much black or white it is, this pixel, right? And the point is here that, that here you have a depth of three, but the depth here is already 64. And here the depth is 64 again, uh, uh, 128 and so on. So you see that the, 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 what becomes, so the image size, the spatial part of the image gets smaller and smaller because you get more and more pooling and more and more integration, but the number of features, which is the depth here, increases, and the features are the things we don't know from the brain. These are the columns, so to speak. These are the things we want to know. And they develop here by learning automatically at all these layers at the same time, which is a, a miracle, right? So, and, but this is what we want to know from the brain. What are the features these areas use to, to analyze the input from the lower layer uh, 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 to, to understand um, um, the features for the, or to construct the features of the next layer? So this is actually something fascinating, and this is actually where we could relate these networks very closely to high field imaging or in, in animals' uh, neuronal recording techniques. And as I said before, when people do this, this is just one way to do it. There are many ways to compare. Here it's more specific for local information. Um, then you see that in the early layers of these convolutional nets for visual recognition, you see indeed that the receptive fields or the, the filters which they have mimic very much the receptive field properties in V1. And if you look in V2, V3, you also find something like that. In V4 especially, you find these kind of things. Uh, so in a little bit higher part of the human brain, you find indeed textures and, and stripes, gratings, exactly these features in the next layers. And then, you know, it becomes more and more complex until it, this can be more complex subparts of, of objects and so on, which you combine, of course, to build uh, a specific entity. So therefore, um, um, uh, this has been shown to be quite similar. And now I want to show you um, a kind of more an innovative example, which goes beyond uh, sensory processing alone, namely to a saliency uh, prediction, which is one part of the model, the visual motor model, which we build in the CDP4 project. And um, um, what, we, what we do here is, what you of course all know, that vision is not just a passive process. Vision doesn't mean you just fixate, like, like the deep learning networks, that they usually uh, get one image and process that image, right? But in vision, of course, we have sharp vision only in the foveal part, in a tiny region, actually. You know? So if I, if I, if I look uh, here, I see uh, um, this person focused, right? But already here, it's, it's actually not very focused. But our brain pretends we have a perfect vision everywhere, which is not true. So to see someone sharp, I have to make an eye movement over there, right? And, and, and therefore, vision is scanning. Vision is, uh, is um, um, integrating multiple views of the world. And it is related to action, because you, you have to do uh, eye movements for that, which is a, a, a motor output part, right? And it creates these closed loops I mentioned, where 
where, for example, robotics helps us a lot to make better models because we integrate the output and the input in a common model, in a common system. So therefore, um, um, that aspect uh, is very important. And where do we look at? That's the question of saliency. So if you look at a scene and make eye movements, what are you looking at, right? This is the question of, of, of what is most salient to inspect, right? And um, the classical model, a very famous model by Itti, Koch, and Niebuhr um, 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 had um, uh, an idea how, how saliency is calculated, which is mainly based on feature contrast. And th that what that means is that you, you, you have in the brain, actually for very brain inspired, this is a neural net model, but very much inspired by the brain. It's an old model, it's from 98, uh, 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 but, it, but it has a lot of features at that time which were known about the brain. You know? For example, it had something like V1, V2, V3, V4, and had uh, calculations for color, intensity, orientation, and so on. But it calculated this at multiple scales also, uh, but it calculated the local contrast. We can also call this pop-out. For example, if you have a, a, a red color in a green background, where, what, what is the salient thing? This popping out thing, the, the red blob in the green background, right? So therefore, you calculate local contrast. And you do this for, for all kinds of features which you found in the early areas of the visual cortex. For example, also orientation. If you have vertical bars all, all over the place and in the middle or somewhere, a horizontal bar, you will make an eye movement to there because it pops out. It is a contrast difference. And that's uh, uh, when you calculate these first for each feature, like orientation, color, texture, and so on, then you integrate these calculations of feature contrast in each feature first specifically, then you calculate that and put that in one map, spatially co-registered map, which is called the saliency map, which is here on top, where you get all the contrast ca calculations from, from the different features in one map, where you have then a spatial distribution which tells you where something they call it nicely, where something conspicuous is, right? Where you, where you want to look at as something, say, interesting or salient, right? And then you, you make usually a saccade to that. Your attention is then there, but you can then follow that. Covered attention means you hold your attention then there where it's interesting, but you don't make the eye movement. This is called covered attention, right? But then when you follow with the eyes, you make an overt uh, eye movement, a uh, uh, real eye movement, other the tension shift, and then you basically attend the location that's meant here, and then um, there is also a mechanism, there's also evidence uh, uh, that this is implemented in the brain of inhibition of return, so if you attend somewhere, you kind of inhibit that because uh, you know this now, and then this network will find the second salient thing and makes another eye movement to the second salient and third salient object and so on. That is how this network works. And it was at that time, um, here you see this just an example, you see how here is the pop-out and orientation uh, pop-out and, and the idea is that um, uh, um, there's lateral inhibition of the same, uh, in the same feature maps. That means if, I, if I'm uh, this kind of more or less horizontal feature here, slightly oblique, then I have negative connections to other, in my neighborhood, other horizontal ones. So they inhibit each other and, and their activity is a bit reduced. Right? This guy is lucky because he's alone there. So there are no other vertical ones or slightly oblique vertical ones. So he does not get lateral inhibition. And that's why he stands out in this feature map. Uh, he's higher active. And then they, they normalize this. And then the guy peeks even more out. Right? So in principle, um, um, there is a um, very nice calculational principles which explain how we can find this contrast saliency. And if we apply this now to uh, a, an input, which is shown there on top, then the model finds nicely there is this uh, 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 no longer speed limit sign and this kind of emergency phone. And these are the things which the model, uh, the saliency map indeed highlights there. So that seems to work. People were very happy about that. I actually implemented that in my own model in a very similar way. And it worked kind of well for, for what? For toy stimuli, from, from lab stimuli. This is a one of the few demonstrations of more real picture, but in reality, you used it for pop-outs and for stimuli um, um, that um, yeah, worked well. And if you put it to real stimuli, then you found that it fi often finds uh, things which humans do not look at, namely some contrasts fully meaningless somewhere, right? 
So when humans look at, at, at natural stimuli, they attend or focus on or find salient semantically rich information over the simple contrast saliency. Only if there is no semantics, yes, then this, the contrast saliency guides your, your, your eye movements. But if there is something interesting in the picture, interesting I now mean in, in quotes, interesting can be a face, which is much more interesting than a little bit of a green-blue background change, right? You, we look at the face, nothing else. But a face is not in the model of Etienne Koch and Niebuhr. So it will never look at a face, except the border of the face has a high, the highest contrast to the background. But it has nothing to do with the face. The model doesn't know about face, right? And that led us to um, um, formulating a new model. Um, that part I will skip because of time. We also did realistic input, but this is not so important. But the main idea is to use such a convolutional network and use this teleological approach, this functional modeling approach. So what we did is we trained, or we used even first, and then later retrained with, with more realistic input. We trained um, 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 uh, or used trained models for object recognition, kind of the best or state of the art models of object recognition, but then we cut the upper layers. The upper layers have very high level features uh, and go only, uh, only decode that into to, to kind of categorical labels like bird or so. This we removed and we kind of made a so-called uh, encoding decoding network in the sense that we keep kept that part and then had here a new part which decoded the abstract semantic representation. Imagine face-like or, 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 or dog-like, features you need to know at some point that there are features from, from, from categories which humans uh, 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 categorize. And then we, we, we let it go back and predicted the salient information in that picture from human data. So, so, so how do we know that this is the salient spot there, which is the training data now for the network? We know it because we let humans, not we, but we used internet data, databases of tens of thousand cases where humans uh, looked at these data or labeled where is here something salient, right? And we used these data sets to derive the training data and then train the network on the training data where the input is a natural image and the output is a heat map of saliency derived from human performance. That's the important point. Because now we force this network to develop something which solves the same task humans solve in the same way, same, same output way how humans do it, with the hope it also develops internally uh, representations and so on, which, which, which led it to generalize, like a human will generalize, to new data which is not in the training. Right? That's the point. This is just to show the, the training data itself, so that it came from, from various uh, internet sources. And I should say we also uploaded the final network to this Kekel um, uh, test uh, data, uh, test network cases for saliency, there is one for saliency, and it performs very well, it's in the top three. Um, uh, so it's also as a technical solution a good model, but we did it not for technical reasons, but we did it only for uh, understanding how humans do saliency, right? And here's uh, uh, Alexander Kroner, um, uh, one of my students, and you see that he tests the model after training with very simple stimuli. And you see the model likes things like his face and the cup, but honestly, that would also be done by the E.T. Koch model because there is no background, no interesting background, it's simple. This was just a speed test, whether with his GPU on this computer, and he didn't need supercomputers for that model, whether it works uh, as expected. But then we put it to the, uh, uh, also um, to demonstrate that in the uh, simulated robotics, also on the new robotics platform of HPP, as one module of several other modules, right? So, so and, 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 and you see the system here finds the, the HPP logo, the text, and so on. So things where humans also look, because you want to read what's, what's written there, right? You want to understand that. So you can embed this also in, in, in robotics. Um, but the most interesting thing is, how did it perform for new input as compared to humans, right? So we used now from the training data, um, um, which is split, you have then say 20,000 for training, 10,000 for testing. So we look now uh, uh, what the model is doing for this new, the model has not seen before during training, for new natural images and compare what the network predicts where to look at, where's the cell information in comparison to what the human data shows. And if we do that, you see here a few examples. Uh, ground truth is human. This is from real human data, right? The humans would look here at the screens, of course, uh, and the, the model does too. 
And if we done, then um, uh, go to more, more interesting stimuli, you, you find also great overlap there. Also here, the face, but also here, this, this, this thing. Both the, the humans and the, the model look at the same things here. And that goes on and on and on. I mean, we have uh, a full paper on this. And you will find that um, um, up to 99% or so, the match between human performance and the model is extremely high. So you find a lot of um, um, really complex images, wh which are not so trivial, but you still find the, the similarity between the model, uh, the model is on the right, and the human performance uh, here in this messy scene. Uh, you have maybe pizza here, I'm not so sure, but, but you see both find the same, and some, the laptop, fun, fun, funny enough, the laptop is also found by both, and so on, right? So you have really similar behavior. What humans look at, they find interesting in the scene for attention and for eye movement targets, also the, the network is, is doing. And of course, now we compared it also to the classical model. The best classical model is the Itty koch niebuhr model, right? Which is now shown on the right. And you see, for example, here, where um, the human looks at the face, the, our model looks at the face say in the same way, but the Itty and Koch model finds here this nice contrast-rich part in this image, right? And looks there, not at the face. And of course, it's clear because it has nothing like a face. So therefore, it is important to realize that since we trained this network on, um, natural of, on human performance data, how humans perform, we forced this network to develop representations, including semantic knowledge, semantic saliency, like phases, chairs, are more important than a slight contrast of such a grid there of the chair, right? You look there maybe if you have a lot of time, but not first. The most important thing are semantically interesting information. And now comes um, um, an important insight. First, we, we, we add there some lateral connectivity to make it even capture, so our model captures then even the things like pop out. You know, our current model does it, but not as good as Etienne and Koch. So if we use lab stimuli, not with semantic information, just, just um, simple stimuli, then our model is not as good as the Etienne and Koch model. But we now have added in our training, in our model, also lateral connections in the early layers. And they now develop saliency calculations of contrast, which normally has not a strong effect on the output. But if you have nothing, no semantics here, then the model like Itty and Koch uses indeed the, the saliency is there. So you see that we can even now make a better model, not a purely convolutional network, but we add now lateral connectivity, recurrency in the model, which helps to make the model better to predict some human data, which could not be predicted well before. But if you compare the models, the new model we have, even without the lateral connectivity, is already predicting much better human data than the classic, best classical model. And of course, um, uh, yeah, just more examples. Um, um, uh, what I want to uh, say is, the most important point is that this, in our lab, has now led to new hypothesis testing. I didn't know? Okay. Um, uh, hypothesis testing. So we go now and test this model um, 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 using brain imaging data. And the idea here is that we think that the model inspires us to rethink about how the human brain works. Because, you know, until now, the people in the textbooks, and many people believe, the Etienne Koch model, I'm not saying it's a bad model, but that's how we calculate saliency. And the model is very specific where these areas are. They are in early visual cortex, and they gain, the saliency map is in the parietal lobe. So it makes specific assumptions how the human brain works, which functions you attach to different parts of the brain. And what our model shows is that it might be that these higher level areas um, also, ah, this I will skip, this is, uh, okay. that these higher level areas also get input from the output of the ventral visual stream, because we know that faces and objects are calculated in the human brain in this part of the brain. So in the Itty Koch model, you only have a pathway up here and then to the frontal cortex, fr frontal eye field for eye movements, attention. Uh, here you have the saliency map and, 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 and also the so-called parietal frontal attention network. But you basically now make a new hypothesis based on this deep learning model, which explains better human data than classical model. You make a new hypothesis, namely that there must be connections from the ventral visual cortex to the saliency map if this is really the integral output of saliency. This cannot be correct. And now we use decoding techniques to, to read out the information there. 
And if we have stimuli which contain semantic information, say a face here and something else here, like, like a pop-out here, then we would predict that the face gets the highest peak even in a, in a spatial map we find over there. So what I want to just tell you is it goes now the other way. It goes not only the way that we use these networks as, as uh, um, um, you know, from, 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 from some ideas to help us to understand and make technically good models, but we really um, um, uh, take them more serious as real brain models and they lead us to also develop hypotheses which we can then go back into the brain and check backwards from these models whether this is true or not. We don't know this yet, so this experiment is just running. So and we hope soon to know whether the predictions coming from this saliency deep learning network uh, are true and help us to understand some new aspects about the real human brain. And because of time, I have a few more slides, but because of time I will stop. Thank you very much for your attention.